accurate than others, but it's fascinating what she has been able to put together. So she's done a massive amount of work. She's traveled all around Texas because she went to go and look at all of these or all that she could in person, has done a great deal of research tracking things down in the archives. So I'm, I give her kudos for the work she's done and I look forward to uh, her sharing it with you. researching Tom Lee III for three years. So your support and interest have been invaluable and really honored to be able to share this journey with you. One thing that I would like to present to you with the painting as well as the highlight is a critical story behind Tom Lee's mural. The Comanche with the hope that details are just as crucial to the actual mural. One thing that I wanted to make sure is that I did bring up my methodology. During methodology, an outline and a plan must be in place, especially when traveling. I traveled to cities in two weeks, and looking at this map, I did not hit every single one of them, but, but if anybody wants to know, there's all of them <laughs> throughout Texas. So not all 20 or so did I visit. However, I did visit the ones with the most meticulous and even there was a surprise city. That was not originally on my scope, but I definitely needed and helped tie everything together. All of these murals all date back to the um, WPA. They were aimed to bring jobs to the American people. During the challenging years of the Great Depression, President Roosevelt's words in his 1933 inaugural address resonated deeply. He urged citizens, including artists, to find a purpose to one another. And by 1937, in his address, Roosevelt criticized disparagement of those on relief, <coughs> emphasizing the value of service over judgment. Sorry, my papers are here. He stated that ending, that ending relief was not the solution, but rather a call to eradicate <coughs> starvation. As the nation grappled with economic turmoil, Roosevelt recognized the potential of artists as contributors to societal recovery. Each city within America commissioned art to showcase the historical background of each location. While some artists were muralists, some became muralists during <clears throat> the WPA era, using their perspective on the American dream. The impact of the New Deal on artists was profound as it provided sustenance, employment, and hope. The administrator of work relief, which was Harry Hopkins, commissioned funds for nearly 100 artists. The Public Works Project, the, the, or it's the PWAP, a component of the ambitious 1933 public building program, allocated a percentage of construction costs for art resulting in thousands of artworks displayed nationwide, even in small towns like Seymour. Where the population was less than 2,400, the number of people employed exceeded the local populace, symbolizing the widespread impact of the New Deal program, like the WPA, the FAP, and PWAP, or in other words, the alphabet soup that provided both economic relief and cultural enrichment across small towns across the United States. This is a testament to the power of art in inspiring hope and resilience during challenging times. Some of the criteria that was required for the muralist to be commissioned is they had guidelines and themes for executing the mural studies. Scenes of local interest and events were deemed the most suitable. The more popular themes were historical events showing heroism, 
FDR particularly liked the ones which he could recognize people. If he could recognize, so could other people. FDR's message was that if people can relate to the art, there was hope for reform. And I'll pause the whistle click. So we'll see. One inspiration that may have been part of the criteria was the manifest destiny. So if you can click on that. I'd like to show you this video, and it kind of explains on how the manifest destiny works. And it doesn't also. And since it does not load, I do have a backup. <laughs> Only to be <laughs> One aspiration of these murals was the idea of the manifest destiny. The road to the west. John O'Sullivan, the Democratic Party of 1845, coined the term, but it came to highlight the necessity of annexing Texas and the American expansion to the West during 1845. This painting is located at the Smithsonian on the right-hand side and depicts the westward expansion of John Gast of a, in 1872. So one thing I wanted to know about was the subject matter of the actual art piece itself. This picture on the left is the territory of the Comanche tribes and the red area that shows the migration pattern through Texas. The picture on the right is from Sis Parker, and I got to meet her in Seymour, Texas, and she is the great niece, great, great niece of Cynthia Ann Parker. And the person on the left, or I'm sorry, the right is W.H. Porter, Portwood, who has just signed a treaty of Baylor Count Ranchers. It's a meat treaty that they intersected to be able to cohabitate and transfer meat. One famous story up from Seymour, Texas, that the city, citizens remember about Tom Lee's mural is that of Cynthia Ann Parker. The Comanche rode into Fort Parker with about two to 300 Native Americans looking for a water source. The Parkers had come down originally in 1834 and built the fort to preach Christianity to the local tribes. It was a noble <laughs> idea. Their mistake was that they built the fort just outside of Calvary from the protection of those soldiers. They were out in the Indian Territory where Calvary could not protect them. The Comanche thought everybody lived in the fort, but many of them lived in the surrounding area. Driving the raid was the Comanche who killed five people and took five captives. Of those was Cynthia Ann Parker and the brother John were among them. The Comanche raised them just like they were 24 years she lived with them. Cynthia Ann stayed with the Comanches where she was raised as Comanche and married Peta Nakona, chief of the Nakotes band of the Comanches. She fully assimilated <coughs> into the Comanche lifestyle. Cynthia Ann had blue eyes, blonde hair, and a little girl, gorgeous. Anyway, <laughs> however, the Comanches took her as their own. Cynthia Ann was a hard worker and mother to Quanta Parker, and that's the gentleman you see here. In December of 1860, Saul Ross and his Texas Rangers from Fort Sill showed up to the Comanche while the males were out hunting, leaving the females and the children and elders behind. Saul Ross, alongside with the Texas Rangers, recaptured Cynthia Ann, took her back home to the Parker family, killing Pata Nakona, which was Cynthia Ann's husband, and she ended up passing away from a broken heart in 1864. Everyone in Seymour knows that story, and that's why I brought that up to show, showcase this particular one, because whenever I would speak with people of the town, that was the story that they would relate to whenever they saw this mural. This story has significance to Seymour and ca could have inspired Tom Lee III's mural, highlighting the Comanche's people presence in the region. His art serves as a window in the past, reminding contemporary viewers of bygone eras. Lee's mission, was to encapsulate the historical narrative in a single moment, as he eloquently expressed in 1938. The function of a mural painting in a community is to deepen and enrich a people's perception of its own tradition and the character of its own land. During this time in Texas, the nostalgia for history and a reminder of how Wild West was considered by some a free spirit, 
hope, courage, and community involvement during the Great Depression. Understanding and preserving our local history is crucial as it helps us connect with our roots and appreciate the journal, journey that has led us to where we are today. Concerns about the mural's compatibility with the new post office, integrity prompted deliberation with Walter Myers being the postmaster at the time. He was expressing reservations, the region's history, aligning with the community sentiment. When the contract was approved, a letter was sent to Walter Myers stating that Seymour Post Office was to receive the art commission. Normally, people would be very excited about this, but from, and also from Tom Lee III, who was concerned that the art would end up taking away from the new post office. So Mayer wrote to, to Rowan, who was actually part of the WPA Fine Arts. And in his letter, he stated, as placing it in the lobby, of course, I judge left that it is left to the discretion of your department and the Federal Works Agency. However, I would prefer the lobby without a mural unless it depicts something of history of this section. I think that is the general opinion of the, of the, uh, citizen, of the citizens in, within Seymour. So Rowan provides that and says the mural definitely depicts the history of the region in Seymour. Respectfully. <laughs> Once completed, Tom could not install the mural for World War II had called his name. According to Mr. Lee's work journal, he completed the Comanche mural on June 21, 1942. One of his friends, Jose Acebus, installed it on May 8, 1942. Mr. Lee, of course, could not install it himself because he, was start he had gotten called into New York for Life magazine. One aspect of the Comanche mural was the choosing of a subject. The Comanches, because of his interest in horses, and as the earlier thing <laughs> you know about the horses, in his diary he mentions how he started one horse and finished another horse until the mural had all of the horses finished. Tom also mentioned in his interview with Adair Margo, he had a friend named Frank Dobby an author who wrote the Wild West books, the dime novels, known as Mr. Texas. I knew a great deal about horses. Tom was also fascinated with George Caitlin, who painted the Native American tribes throughout the United States. The Comanches were the plains finest horsemen and measured their wealth by the number of horses that they had owned. The Seymour mural is an excellent opportunity to combine his history or interest in Native American culture and horses all in one mural. When Tom received the award to the commission of the post office at Seymour, postmaster, of course, was concerned about the mural, about the subject matter, and then added the action of the Seymour, Tom Lee writes her directly to him, stating that the subject matter is natural for Seymour, Texas. The town is in the heart of the former marches of the wild Comanches, any old-timer's eye will light up with the Comanche story at the mere name, mention of the name. The picture will need no explanation from the citizens of Seymour. Early frontier observers are unanimous in their admiration for the superb horsemanship of the Comanches. Among the North America's wild, daring, and skillful riders, authorities place the Comanches at the top of the list. So it is natural to paint them on horseback wild and free, the boundless plains in the early light. These pictures here <clears throat> is the attention to detail of each of the murals, or each, each aspect of the mural <clears throat> is what I really like about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we go from the top right, that's Quantum Parker's great grandson. The shield, if you notice, is almost identical to the actual shield on the actual rider itself. They only carried these shields when they were going to war. The headdress, while some have feathers, there were some that were bullhorn, as seen on the Quahati. 
This one at the top right is the Quahati, and this one is a picture from, you can see how there's a bullhorn, and this is a Comanche picture that's located at the Smithsonian. The moccasins also, what, it may be hard to see in the actual picture itself, but the moccasins were very traditional. This set is from Tonakar, it's the great-great-grandson of Quanah Parker, and he was very fortunate to let me take a peek at these. <laughs> and the last picture on the very bottom left is the actual, um, that's Quanah Parker and one of his wives. Comanches had several, he had seven. So I hope you can see these, but these are the actual uh, diaries from that. So, but Tom had help. A lot of artists during that time, especially when there was a mur big mural like this. <clears throat> Jose Acevas helped Tom with the Comanche mural. He painted the sky and the ground. He also helped hang the actual mural at Seymour when he had to get called away. Very explicit directions, even how to mix the glue. The case study is the surviving pieces that I'm aware of, and that's the case study. There was a letter from Rowan to Lee about the negative space. So on the negative space here, you can see that this is how it was shown. And if you look at the original mural, there was a, a discrepancy about the space. And as far as I know, it was never altered. That brings us to Jose Acevas. Right after this mural <laughs> that he had just hung, he may have been the understudy of Tom Lee. However, he was also part of the fine arts and the WPA. This depiction of the pioneer life was commonality among the art, complementing the manifest destiny. One thing to notice is the trading post on the right-hand side. This trading post was actually a commercial ploy to stop back the town of Mart. The story goes that the citizens wanted the post to be t depicted, even though it never even existed. To Jose Acevas added this to the mural to, so that the town of Mart would have their story depicting an actual post. <laughs> the townsfolks loved the incorporation of the trading post and the painting. It was not just the pioneer way of life, but it was also how things were hustling and bustling within the town. The train coming through the farming of towns and bustling of people being prosperous and working. Alice Reynolds captures this in the founding and subsequent development of Robstown. Like Tom Lee, she was also self-taught. When she entered the contest and she won the design for the post office murals, she wanted to have the town full of interest and a good deal of conviction of the landscape. This piece represents a strong sense of community and a bountiful work to build up the town's spirit. Also, Alice Reynolds, um, just a little side note, she was a musical artist and got into mural painting. So I thought that was rather curious that they took all aspects of life. This one is by Jody Young. He also had an alternative lifestyle. Some people may have even remembered or recognized him, but he's a movie artist who found himself wanting to illustrate his childhood passion at the age of 10. He got to meet Will Rogers. As a boy, he wanted to depict the head of the herd of a chuck wagon. He acted in several Western films and in 1939 wanted to paint off to the northern markets. Young promoted the authentic early Western lifestyle by opening the northern ranges and markets to the Texas cowmen, spelled the economic salvation of the people. This is Howard Cook. The pioneer life of the cowboys was substantial. However, other artists wanted more of a historical context. With Howard Cook's rendition of San Antonio's importance with Texas history, several panels this is a huge room, by the way, and it encapsulates the entire room. The post office and the federal courthouse. Howard Cook was a printmaker, and he studied at the Springfield, Massachusetts, at, uh, 
from the um, Art Students League in the 1920s. However, his oil paintings was what got him recognized in this piece. This artwork seen here represents the selection of the significance within the Native American. On the right, a Franciscan monk it instructs religion and agriculture, showing a more submissive side to the natives. One thing to note is the background of hard labor and building mission. On the left, Stephen F. Austin, is who is showing the pioneers of Texas, this depiction shows how the Native Americans are not only scared, but also a, this is a nod to the manifest destiny. This depiction of Coronado's exploration party in Palo Duro Canyon shows the Native Americans' aggression. Even though there is hostility, the Texas Rangers appear to be higher in placement within the mural. While the natives are positioned lower within the piece, Julius Waltz was the head of the Department of Art at the Sol State Teachers College in Alpine, Texas. Does everybody remember who Saul Ross was? Cynthia? Okay. Thought that was interesting. Anyway, <laughs> one thing to remember is that the Native Americans are now wearing the stereotypical feathered headdress and wielding the bow. Unfortunately, a lot of stereotypical art does happen to come in, and it's usually from how they get inspired. The naming of the quantum mural is the scene that highlights the critical aspect of the history and economic development of Hardman County. The esteemed Comanche chief, Quanah Parker, is depicted in his full ceremonial regalia, standing opposite an armed white man. Quanah prominently holds a peace pipe with one hand. That's the stereotype that is <laughs> depicted quite often within some of the murals. Gesture's a sign of peace, or in other words, a lot of people say how. The hand signal is not how. The Comanche show a sign of peace or hello. This idea arose from the dime novels of the Wild West and the Buffalo Bills traveling shows. The Comanche shown here is Suzanne Schurer's mural. This was my surprise city that I happened to fall upon when I was traveling. Indian Buffalo Hunt depicts a more accurate and highlights the accuracy of the Comanche. Like Tom Lee's painting, both paintings underscore the importance of the horses and how the Native Americans were skilled riders, which was their prized possession. Suzanne studied at the California School of Fine Arts and also taught at the public school during the Great Depression. Suzanne received the commission to paint in Caldwell as well as Eastland, Texas Post Office. Schwerer took a more respected approach and wanted to embrace the culture and tradition of the Comanche tribe by embracing the tribe's skill on, in this scene. A side note is listened to on Eastland, Texas. This little story here is called Old Rip. The rumor has it that they had a time capsule and they wanted that to be incorporated within this story. When they unearthed the time capsule after 20 years, the lizard twitched and moved and became Eastland's mascot because everybody cheered. So <laughs> being Eastland's mascot, Suzanne embraced this legend and incorporated it into the city for the mural at the post office there. So staying true to Suzanne's empathy approach toward this displacement of Native Americans, Indian's movie is a more romantic picture of a cyclical mi migration of Plains Indians. It is also subtle criticism of the federal government's policy that displaced the Indians from their native lands. Suzanne directly expresses the artistic sympathies with the unfair treatment of Indians who were ousted from their homes and forced to march across country. Shwari explains, I am interested in the American Indian and feel sympathetic towards that race of people which was so speedily eradicated by our present civilization. I believe that a reminder, even though it may be in the form of a picture to any one of us of the life in this country that preceded ours can do no harm. 
especially life in its simplicity and harmony with nature can be a lesson to us in many ways. Overall, the theme throughout the post office murals was to bring hope during the Great Depression. The Wild West theme was part of the American dream to bring the citizens of the United States a sense of community belonging, an awareness of historical past, and a happy memory of, from the Wild West shows or dime novels that individuals grew up with. The artist Tomley brought a sense of being wild and free among the horses to encourage a smile upon the citizens of, of the town. Each piece is a reminder that in the face of hard times, with hard work and ingenuity, Americans can persevere and be stronger than before. I don't mean to get emotional, but thank you all. I have so many people to thank. <laughs> part of the master's thesis as well as the dissertation. So I've gotten the green light, go ahead. Um, but I do want to thank all of the people from the Friends at the Tomley Institute, Dr. Summers for believing in me, um, Dr. Villalobos um, wasn't able to make it tonight, the special collections, Lance Tamakero, the great-grandson, great-great-grandson of Quanta Parker, Sis Parker, and the citizens of Seymour, and my husband. Thank you all. And does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. You had mentioned about uh, some murals being in disrepair and things like that. Yes. Were you able to, through your research, find out how or what is the plan for conservation or any possible interventions for that, whether it's Tom Lee or the other uh, the other ones? So the ones that I saw are in pristine, like pristine. Um, there was a couple of them that were in d disrepair to where they've got them like in storage. Um, and they did d digital copies of the best that they possibly could because again, some of these just, some of the buildings actually like are no more, mm -hmm. like they're gone. But because they're federal projects, they have to be stored in some way, shape, form, or another. Um, with the documents from Nora, all of the all of the microfish is gone, and it's just due to time. It could be because they, when they moved a, original works into one building into another building, all the air, all the exactly. Light. So that's I was lucky to get what I could on the case study of the mural in general. It's not finished, but yeah. yes. <laughs> the, um, so, so I've also done research on Tom Lee in the past, and after this happened to you, you run into a lot of people who they have concerns over his depictions of Native Americans. There's a lot of controversy on that. So, in light of your research, uh, what do you feel is the historical memory of Tom Lee? His oral history has the best history, but I had 20 minutes, not 45. Does that make sense? So there's probably a good chapter of where he was interacting. He, I guess he grew up and there was, there was, there was interaction with uh, the Native Americans. And then of course being with Frank Dobby and being out in the Wild West, um, I couldn't even add that story. That would have added, you know, but um, they used to go out and actually study and look at the horses and everything like that when he was hanging out at the ranches and stuff like that. So his interconnection as an artist, he was very diverse in meeting a lot of people. But yeah, the oral history is the best. <laughs> you else? All right. What's your favorite mural now that you've looked at several of them? Um, of course I love the Comanches because I've been working on it for three years. But when I found Suzanne Schroeder's, and it was an accidental find, I happened to stay in an Airbnb, and it was like an hour from this city, an hour from this city, and I 
somebody had a postcard sitting on my Airbnb desk. I'm like, where's that? What's that? They said, oh, that's at the little post office here. I was just like, oh my goodness. That to me, to be able to tie that in because both of the artists are kind of similar in wanting to highlight the Native Americans versus the stereotypical side. So in that aspect of those two, those were those two of my favorites. The scariest was Robstown. Only because the uh, hurricane was coming through, I literally got the picture and then got the evacuation. <laughs> Yeah. Tom Lee 101 question. Sure. Did, did he ever own um, horses? As far as I know, I am unaware of that information. So oh. I, I, I don't know if he did or he may have, but in my research, I never I came across research it. On Tom Lee, by the way. <laughs> sure. Anyone else? Very good. Thank you all so very much. Thank you.